Hey guys, this is Jonathan from Quixel. I'm your friendly local community manager and support lead. And not only that, I also make art too. Who'd have thunk it, huh? So today I am currently gonna be showcasing a work in progress. This is something that we don't normally do here at Quixel, but I think we're gonna be trying to do it more frequently where we actually show the work that we are currently making so that you guys can see kind of how we get from point A to point B, which is, you know, something that you guys normally ask uh, at least some people normally ask which is hey you know how does how does this work how do you get from like concept to to the end result how do you do this how do you do that uh, there, there's so many uh so many different questions you guys have and, and that's one of the most frequent ones which is like how do you get to this how do you get to this point and you can see this is a pretty rough scene and I've kind of had to spend a bit of time to polish it up to even get it ready for presentation. I, I literally only started working on this uh, basically last weekend. Um, so a little backstory on this scene. I started this thing back in 2010 in my advanced level design class back when I was still a student at the Art Institute of Tampa. And again, this is uh, art by Florida man. So, you know, to make that what you will. But that this entire scene uh it's been through a huge design process and i'll show you guys what it originally looked like uh it, it's it's a an interesting little piece of work that kind of ties into my time here at quixel so you'll notice that this is what it used to look like okay so uh, here we are this is the most relevant piece right here so this is pretty much the same exact geo that i've reused except for the floor and i've kind of gotten rid of the pillars i don't know if i really want to bring them back i'll have to play with it i kind of like the openness of it without them so really like i'm just kind of figuring out what i want to do and, and how i want to work with it but to get from this point to this point i'm like i'm super happy with how it looks because i'm thinking in my head like man i wish i was talented enough back when i was a student to do stuff like this i would it would have been nice of course, I also would have liked to have the, the scans that we, that we work with here at Quixel, too. So um, just so you guys are aware, I will be watching chat. I will try to respond as much as I can. We do have a non from Quixel and possibly other, uh, other guys coming into the chat as well. So I will, again, I'll try to answer anything I can, but I'm going to have kind of a script I'm going to try to talk about as I go through this so you guys can at least get my thought process on what I'm doing. Um, but one of the things I want to mention is, uh, and the reason why I actually am doing this scene right now, is that this actually ties back to the beginning of me working in this company. Uh, I didn't know back in the day that this was going to happen, and that Quixel was going to become Quixel as it is currently. But if you go to philipk.net and look at the tutorials, you'll see uh, a really old tutorial for a piece of software that you may know better as Endu. Uh, back when it was fil like still a Photoshop action, <laughs> and that's when I used it. Okay, so I've I've been associated or working with stuff that Quixel has produced since I've been in college, and that was over ten years ago at this point. And when I learned about Endu, I'm like, this blew my mind. Now you know, college me can only do simple stuff like draw circles with Endu because I wasn't I was so stressed out with work and and you know having a kid and all that other stuff I was doing in school that I just wasn't able to you know do much technical art that I really wanted to do so uh, I, I kind of you know look at it like it's I'm coming full circle like I'm taking something that I originally started with Quixel's tools before it was even called Quixel and then I'm refining it with the same tools 10 years later so going from here to here to me is just such a humongous like undertaking and I'm, I'm so happy with how it's coming out um so instead of working with Endu in this scene, I've actually been using Mixer for everything. Um, so Mixer has been for the walls, it's been for the floors. Uh, the majority of the scene has been done. Uh, actually, everything in here is, is made with Megascans and Mixer. So it's completely made within the Megascans ecosystem, except for the tree. That was actually done with Speed Tree. But, you know, it's not really a scanned tree. It's just something that I... I wanted to upgrade from an old 3D Studio Max Willow tree into something that was a little bit more suited to what I thought would work. So yeah, um, let me see. See, so, yeah, like I said, this was made with the original version of Endu. So I mean, I, I, I just think it's cool to, to be able to go back and just showcase how we can go from, from old to new uh, while still keeping some of the design motifs from the original, uh, like the, the silver trim and the vines and whatnot, but actually making it look halfway decent rather than 
<laughs> super old like it was with the uh, UDK version. And this is actually using Unreal 4.23. And if you guys haven't been aware yet, uh, that actually shipped with what's, what's called material parameter collections, which are just really, really, really useful tools for artists to finally have like control over everything in the scene. Um, and I'll go over that too before the, the stream is done. But yeah, uh, let's see. Let's let's look and see what you guys are saying in chat here. I've had so many windows up, it's kind of hard to keep up with everything. You wouldn't believe, like I have three monitors, right? And then I've got my details panel on the left and I've got my content browser on the left and I've got the modes, the levels. I've got everything up here. So it becomes uh, quite hard to keep up with everything when you're trying to keep up with the chat too. So, all right, so John Cena. How much detail would you like to put into the modeling process of this in Maya, or say using Maya versus textures to replace that detail in the pavement instead of textures, if you couldn't use mega scans? Um, I would probably do a ton of modeling work if I could. Um, but fun fact, I actually did use Max for this. So let's get out of the camera and I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I isolate this, actually, you know, yeah, yeah, I'll isolate it. Sometimes Unreal crashes when you isolate only one thing but this time it's not, so we can actually see the wireframe of it. This is a super basic pattern <clears throat> made with Mixer using uh, a couple of uh, shapes in the mass stack just to kind of break up the edges and make it look like, you know, like a stone pathway. And instead of using displacement, which I, I don't mind doing, but I just don't like the overhead and the, the slowness that it produces in dynamic lighting. I went ahead and I just traced over it with Max. So I just loaded the uh, displacement map in there and literally just traced over the shapes with Max, cut it through, and then let like completely averaged all the normals so it's totally flat. So if I was to take this texture off of here and show it to you inside of the of this view, so if I go ahead and clear or sorry copy this and then clear it, it should just be completely flat. Like there is the only lighting on here is coming from like occlusion and whatnot. So this is actually all being fed from the normal map. So the normals do all the work. And that's, you know, that was the whole point of making the surface and mixer, because if it l works as displacement, it's going to also work as geo. So essentially all it did was uh, it took a little bit of time to, to make it work, but it was a lot better than trying to make it work at however many frames I would lose from having it run with real time displacement. So that's that's pretty much my view on it. If I can, I, I'm not trying to make this for games. I'm making this for personal work and just to showcase the power of our scan, uh, like scan ecosystem. But at the same time, if I can optimize stuff so that I don't chug when I'm running this, that that's fine. Um, and and again, it's this engine's really good at handling polygons, but there's only so many any engine can take. Like if I go to my outliner here and take all these oaks that I made from my last scene, you guys saw, and hide them you'll notice that my frames immediately jump up, sometimes even more than 10. Um, the first time I hid these, it was closer to a, like, I went from 30 to 40 frames. So if I turn this back on, you'll see a massive drop. Yeah, easily 10 frames. So I, I have them there just kind of like a guide. I'm actually going to go back in speed tree later on. Uh, I don't have the time to show it to you guys today, but I am going to go back and make these sable palms. Um, another fun fact about this and kind of how my vision for art aligns with Quixels is that this is all stuff that I took photographs of when I lived in my apartment in Tampa. And like all these plants, every single one of these I took pictures of, cut them out in Photoshop to make the transparency, and then made uh, crude blends between like the different barks and whatnot to, to produce these effects just to try to make it like it was like a really not so good version of photogrammetry so like the, the really old school way of doing this and it shows right because you can see the way i did these plants normals and endu like endu can only do so much so it's with normal maps it's very much a garbage in garbage out kind of thing if you produce bad inputs you also get bad output so there's only really so much it can do from a flat photograph and like i tried my best to get photos on like cloudy days so that there wasn't too much ambient lighting like on these plants but again I was only a student so I did the best with what I had and it, I don't want to say that it holds up I really don't think that it does but then again I'm also my worst critic so maybe somebody thinks it looks cool I don't I, I think I can do a lot better now but I also have a humongous scan library behind me helping me do that um, so pretty soon here I'll be taking those um, palmetto bush scans that we have and actually turning them into um, 
sable palms that I will then place above here and mix them up with the live oaks. That should give me some more frames back. Just, you know, and, and, and the frames, like I said before, aren't so much for optimization for a game. It's optimization so I don't want to tear my hair out while I'm trying to work in here. Because if it starts moving like this and I get two frames a second, I can't work like that. The, for those of you who have been following Quixel and me for a while, uh, you may have seen my Florida Ethanol Train project. And that, when I did the live stream, was running at like 10 frames a second because of how many, how many plants were in it and how much overdraw was in it. It was ridiculous. Like, there's a lot of that in here, too. If we uh, go to the, what is it, the, the uh, overdraw viewport, we should be able to see a significant amount just because of all the plants and also because of all the fog that I've added. So there's going to be drawbacks running that, too, in real time. So it's a fine balance. It's like, I want this to look as good as I can make it look, but I also don't want to go crazy while I'm trying to work. Yeah. <laughs> There's the overdraw right there. <laughs> oh my lord, that is awful. And and funny, the the overdraw viewport runs really fast. Like this is like almost uh, sixty frames per second. But then you turn it back off, and now we're back down to twenty three. So yeah. So like I said, this this is uh, a project to me. It's really special to me. My wife really loves it. She's always been like this, telling me to remake this and. I've just kind of been kind of waiting for the mega scans library to catch up with some of the assets that I needed to make, um, especially like ground covers and flowers. Uh, when I first made the scene, I had to make flowers by hand. Uh, definitely didn't look very good. Um, these garlics right here, these white ones, I actually have something very similar in my front yard that I just planted. So uh, it's kind of cool to be able to put them in here in the, in the, in the virtual world too. So, and uh, to answer hman287 no this is not using ray tracing i am currently on a gtx 1080 ti and i have 32 gigabytes of ram and an intel i7 6700k processor for those of you guys who want to know system specs so yeah so my uh now that you have the history behind this and how like this scene originally used a very crude version of photogrammetry and now it actually uses real photogrammetry thanks you know thanks be to teddy and all the other guys who make the magic happen at quixel so i can do cool stuff like this uh, yeah let's move on to the, the creation process again i started out with just working with these slabs right so these are done in mixer i can't actually show you um the part in mixer because it's just you know it's going to be too much to run simultaneously so just have to trust me on this it's a pretty basic setup uh, i'll kind of go over it real quick um, the two quadrants at the top and bottom were just using a square pattern and the square pattern was set so that it had four repetitions. I masked out the center so that there's only a rep, a, a rep at the top and a rep at the bottom. And then I just added some squares at the bottom to kind of break that up. And then using the curvature pattern, I tried to get a little bit of a stylized painterly look with the white edges, uh, using curvature and a little bit of like a moon motif coming in there just popping in from the top i may go back to this and add displacement to these walls or i could just be cheeky and cut this in the problem is these walls uh it's going to be very obnoxious having to do that because they're they're curved so displacement would be the easiest way to go about it it's just going to run awful so i may do that at the very end when i just hit the render button and don't have to work in here anymore that would be the best solution to that so, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, Deus Wolf says, I might miss the fun and colorful user interface design found with Endu and Didu. Mixer seems to be a bit more toned down on that front. Um, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree there, but I do get where you're coming from. It, I mean, Endu and Didu were both more of a, um, they were, they're, they're obviously Photoshop plugins and they, they use Photoshop's design language. Uh, with Mixer, it's our own tool and it's developed entirely in-house, so we're not really depending on anything else. And right now, I mean, I don't want to talk about the future. There's a lot of stuff coming that you guys are going to be super excited about. There always is. Every time we, we have a stream, we tell you guys that because that's just how we work. We're always improving things. Um, so, you know, just keep an eye out. I think you're going to love the direction Mixer's going. Um, let's see. Any other questions from you guys? Uh, Rashi would like to know, uh, how can I get in touch after the live section for queries? Um, I'll tell you guys at the end of the stream, like I always do, <clears throat> but kindly feel free to visit us at facebook.com slash groups slash Quixel Tools Group, all one word. 
That is our art community. It used to be called the Tools Group. It is no longer known as that. It has something like 18 or 19,000 people in it now. It's it's quite large. I'm very impressed that you guys love us so much that you, uh, you hang out there and chat and talk and, and show off your work. Um, I actually started the, the stream announcement there, so some of you guys may be coming from there. Uh, but yeah, super excited that you guys are here. Again, back to the scene. Um, so, like I said, I try to make this stuff in Max when possible. Max is my preferred modeling tool. I'm not uh, against anything else. I uh, actually had a stream with Brandon and Larry recently on the Game Jev's Unchained slash GDUX podcast, where I talked about how uh, Blender is actually becoming such a, a powerful tool that people may actually just end up, you know, working with that in studios pretty soon. And I'm probably going to have to learn it just because it's getting so powerful. It's kind of hard to ignore. Uh, so, you know, major props to Blender and, and the amount of work they've been doing to improve their tool set to become so production ready. Uh, so, but yeah, for me, I've been using Max for 20 years. In art terms, I'm an old fogey. I'm 35. So maybe I don't sound like it, but I've been around for quite a while. Uh, I just like using Max. Again, 20 year user, it's kind of, kind of hard for me to spend the time learning something else when I'm already good with what I do now. So one of these days I'll upgrade, but, you know, use whatever works for you to, to get where you want to go. Um, essentially, all I had to do with the scene for these walls was just take the geo that I made 10 years ago and rework it a little bit so it was a little rounder. Uh, again, from going from UDK to to now, uh, you can kind of see there's a lot of major issues I had to fix, uh, like you know, obvious texture seams, light map bakes that didn't look very good. Um, and those of you guys who are wondering, yes, I am using dynamic lighting. That is a common theme you're going to find with our streams. Not that we don't like baked lighting. It looks beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. There's nothing that can beat a true baked lighting setup. The problem is anytime I move something in a baked setup, it breaks the lighting. Whereas I can move these little guys around wherever I want them to go. And I don't really have to worry about that breaking the lighting. And I don't have to say, well, oops, light maps don't work now. Uh, it's just more interactive and it's easier to get these concepts across. If we work dynamically rather than in static light map setups. Uh, static light map setups are best for like games when you need to have that performance, when you need to not worry about uh, how many frames you're going to lose from having all these dynamic lights everywhere. Like if we look at the light complexity, you'll notice that it's it's not too terrible. I mean, it's not great. Orange, red, it's it's pretty simple to understand. Blue is the best. Um, for those of you guys who are, whoop, <laughs> hit the wrong button. I was trying to grab the light here. For those of you guys who are wondering, uh, I do... Uh, actually work with a bit of optimization on these things and these lights themselves are actually prefabs that I guess the best way to put it is they're, they're blueprints not prefabs that's an old way of talking about it from UDK uh, again I'm still kind of old school I've worked with UDK for a long time it's what I learned in college so being able to go from UDK to Unreal 4 it was like a, a snap it's basically the same engine in a lot of ways um, obviously not technically but just from the user experience it's very similar uh, so I actually, to, to optimize the scene, I have these things set to an attenuation of 600 millimeters. So you can actually see that when you uh, turn on game mode. They're actually not shooting out as far as they would realistically, but most people can't tell. And it runs well enough that it keeps the light complexity from going too crazy, which then causes massive slowdowns because every one of these overlapping lights has to calculate overlapping shadows and all of the fun stuff and it just makes a chug so again for sanity's sake i need to keep the scene running at least above 20 frames at all times otherwise uh, i just i have a hard time working with it it becomes too hard to understand how these things are meshing together when it looks like i'm watching a slideshow so uh john cena again would like to know if you're making a cinematic scene do you focus on the kinds of shots that you want first, or do you create a basic scene and then plan out the shots that you want from it? I that You're going to find people on both sides of that fence. I'm more of the latter. I like to make the scene and then plan the shots out from that. I, I feel that design is the strongest visual language, and I don't like being stuck with a particular shot. I want the shot to evolve over time. I look at it like... I try to use the Bob Ross techniques when I can, where you learn from experience and you learn from building up from what you've done before. So like if you looked at my train scene that I made, um, when I first made that environment, uh, and maybe I should actually no, nah, I'll pull it up some other time, but just think about this massive wide open field with a locomotive in the center of it and some tank cars behind it. 
I built the entire scene as a playground with which I could romp through the woods virtually and then bring my camera along and shoot it from any angle that I wanted to. And that's kind of what I did here as well. It gives me plenty of options to shoot from. So if I go back into the camera, you, you kind of get what I mean. Um, come in here and pilot this. And you know I can come over here and shoot. I can, I can frame it over here. I can frame it from up here. I can come in here and I can change this camera and make the focal length something like, let's try uh, 12 millimeters. So I can come in here and really get that fisheye lens that captures this entire room and really makes that, that willow tree in the center look way more majestic and grand. So firmly, I believe that these, this, the shots should follow the design, not the other way around. That's how I look at things. Again, there's no correct way to do this. It's all about whether it looks good. If it looks good to you, do it the way you want to do it. But have a reason behind why you're doing it. Uh, the reason I do it the way that I do it is because I think that it works best for me and it has been the way that I've worked for years and I don't find any benefits from trying to plan out shots prior. I, I let them come to me and, and be like, wow, this really, like, I love the way this looks. Like, I like being able to just have the freedom to to not be stuck to a certain script so that that works for me let's see any other questions um let's see uh keep wants to know is this rtx no this is not rtx again this is a 1080 ti i could enable ray tracing to be honest with you guys i haven't had time to even look into it in even if my 1080 ti could do it i'm sure if rtx was on this would run at like three frames Okay, Sanic would like to know, can you give advice on how to get started making shots with a moving camera if you've never done this before? Well, I actually don't move the camera much. Um, the moving that you see here is just me placing it, not so much about like setting up visual like transitions or movements. I'm not an animator. I did study animation at least partially in college as part of my game art design degree, but that animation is one of the toughest things for me to master and it's one of those things that you really have to be focused on if you want to be good at it so i can't really give you a whole lot of terrible like good feedback on that but i can say it's it's a practice makes perfect kind of situation like i just mentioned and the best way to get better at it is to constantly look at how others have done this and then try to understand why they're doing that and better yet there's even really good books out there on how to do proper animation for a lot of things and including camera work so i would recommend looking into that kind of stuff uh, that's out of my area of expertise unfortunately so i can't really help you there too much so anyway popping out of the camera back to the the chat so uh a big part of the scene is foliage for those of you guys who've never used the foliage tool in unreal you are missing out it is quite a treat all of this is just a foliage brush so if you look at all these plants and this little ball that's following my mouse around, it is just placing foliage with a brush tool. So I can come in here and paint plants pretty much wherever I want to paint them at. And it creates instances of them and I have materials set up so that each instance of the plant actually changes in terms of hue and brightness. So you'll see that some of these lilies of the valley actually have like a brightness and hue adjustment to them. And that's done through the material so that each instance is at least somewhat different. And this mirrors how things are like, you know, shown in real life. Like there's no plant that's going to be identical to another one, even if they look really similar. It, it just doesn't happen that way. And that, like having a lush bit of foliage in here really helps sell this. Like this, for those of you guys uh, who don't know, this actually was uh, like my college capstone project so like this was my final project that i made before i graduated so i spent a year working on this um this entire scene was just one part of a massive animation where i had to make a character and then i had to animate this character and then the character like held like a little galaxy in her hand and then the camera panned into the galaxy and, and just bear with me here i gotta explain this whole thing otherwise nothing makes sense and then you're like flying through space kind of like the the star trek tng intro with like saturn and stuff in the background and then you finally like zoom in on earth after you go through the asteroid belt and then you you come flying through this environment uh at like breakneck speed and the animation was kind of like kind of like this where you come through and then it kind of looks up and then it pans around this tree and it's like oh wow look at this tree it's so cool amazing tree and then it moves on it keeps going further and further 
and there's a lot more to this again like this is a, a work in progress but um so this this whole environment like i had a design document set up for it like it was going to actually be a game that i would hope to have produced someday but i gave up on that ambition quickly um for the longest time one of my biggest influences in game design was that game company uh if you haven't heard of them that is literally their name it is that game company all one word and they made games like flower uh flow journey some of these really really cool games that are just basically uh, what's the best way to describe them they're they're more like interactive experiences than games uh they're 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 games in the, se the sense that there's a goal and a and a and a, and a way to achieve that goal but they're not a game in the sense that like you're running around shooting things and the the quick backstory to this is it's basically just like a, a garden area for like this uh, goddess that lives here and it's kind of like a shrine or something i don't remember all the details off the top of my head I, again i wrote this 10 years ago but the whole concept of the games it's basically supposed to be like earth as we know it except slightly different like there's magic and stuff you, you know your typical kind of like environment set in a fictional story but yet uh the magic aspect of it would have been kind of a like here's how you solve puzzles to get around from one area to the other here's how you like try to figure out what's what's in this area what's in that one how do you get from this room to the next kind of like a i wouldn't say like a an adventure room or whatever those things are called when they lock you in some place and you have to find your way out of it but more of just a like how can we make games that don't revolve around shooting things because we have plenty of that not that there's anything wrong with that i mean i still play csgo <laughs> but it would be nice to have some games that do other stuff as well so um yeah <laughs> let's see uh, nero smith says that i made a third person game with my own meshes animations and gameplay systems four levels with non-player characters it was meant as a gift for someone and the person never played it and it really hurt my morale that is Oh, that's not uh, that's that sucks man i'm really really sorry to hear that but it should you know never never let something like that get to you if you can um the work is good for its own sake that you went through all that effort for somebody that's really sweet and um you know that, that's that's very ambitious and um mad props to you for that i mean that's i don't know if i could do that much work for for just one person i mean that's that's a lot of of effort if you'd like to show it off to us sometime though i mean feel free to post that in our facebook group i'm sure we would love to see it and he would also like to know what projects for beginners do you recommend making so that others can play so you could get feedback and don't get bummed out feeling like you made something for nobody um i think the best way to look at any of this stuff is that you should do it for yourself always do things for yourself not that you shouldn't do things for other people as you know like gifts or or as considerations for them but do things because it makes you happy because ultimately you only have one life to live and you should do things in such a way that while you're being a good person you're also trying to live your life in such a way that you're you're doing things that contribute positively to your mental health um you guys may have seen or probably didn't see the the, the substation that i made and for those of you guys who don't know a substation is a basically an electrical looking skeleton on the side of a lot of roads that has a bunch of like orange lights on it and stuff and it it transmits power from a, a power plant and i'm fascinated by these things i love them so much to the point where like i actually made one almost one-to-one -one scale and i used to pass by this thing coming home to orlando from tampa when i was coming home from school and i i was like man i gotta get pictures of this thing so i got pictures of it i built it out for college and then i remade it using unreal 4 like eight years later and the reception to it was just like pfft like not that nobody cared but it just you know like it's it's something that i made for me so i was happy that i was able to just do it like it made me happy knowing that i was able to do something that i set out to do even if the reception to it wasn't what i was hoping it would have been ultimately you got to do things for yourself because if you depend on the expectations of other people to fulfill you you may not always be able to control that so try to try to keep that in mind when you when you when you set out to make projects regardless of what the project is be it art or music or anything else so uh yeah anyway we're kind of getting off into the weeds here so one of the things too is these vines right this is not something i had in the original they were actually growing up the walls uh these are actually mega scans assets as well like like i said everything in here is a mega scans asset these however need to be tweaked a bit i'm going to have to bring these into max and apply some bend modifiers to get them to kind of curve over here and i'd like them to wrap around this um what do you call it this little 
overhang here in addition to just flopping down below so it's going to take some effort off stream for me to get to that point um but that's that's something to think about too when you guys are making these assets don't just look at these things as though they're static you can easily modify these take them into max take them into maya blender whatever modeling tool that you use uh, please know my software is better than your yours wars we're, we're, we're all friends here we're all doing the same thing guys um, but whatever software you use whatever you're happy with bring that in modify it make it yours put it in whatever scene you're working in like i'm absolutely going to take these modify them and make them work for me i will probably even take some of these existing pieces copy them and duplicate them and make a massive piece of vine out of it because well two reasons why not and it's going to look better not that they don't look good as it is they're they're designed for working with flat walls well as you can see these aren't flat walls they're curved so they need a bit of work to to adapt to what i'm doing so that's something to be aware of that is something to think of and, and uh, keep in mind. Uh, Megascan's assets, while scanned, are not exactly set in stone. You can modify them, do just about anything you want with them. You just have to put in a little bit of effort. Um, so, whoop, again, I, I fat fingered it and hit the wrong button. Uh, here we are. So, here's an example of why I need to modify this. This needs to match the curve of this wall, otherwise the the um, the shadowing just doesn't match it's too far off but if i push this into the wall what ends up happening is it gets stuck halfway in so you can you can kind of get around that by using some techniques like jack mckelvey's uh temporal aa dithering technique but that only goes so far ultimately it's better to to get them to be flush with the surface than it is to try to make them connect and interpenetrate in a way that's more aesthetically pleasing so keeping an eye on you guys in the comments it looks like everybody likes motivational talks uh, i try to be helpful again um i don't want to turn this into a life coach session but just you know keep in mind that the thing i always say at the end of every stream is if i can do this stuff you guys can too this is all mega scans assets so you guys can easily do this um just gotta you know put in the time and you know ask around again there's nothing i've learned that i haven't learned from anybody else out there now, you wouldn't believe how much I learned from just doing Google searches on like how to Unreal or how to do this or that. So um, this tree, that's something I didn't cover, uh, speed tree. This is the tree you're seeing. Okay. Now it looks hideous right now because this was not designed with a bark texture in mind. It was designed with a how am I going to make this transition into an icy glow that fades out into this pool of icy water. There's a lot of ways to do it. I personally chose to do it the way that I'm familiar with, which is an old school technique of just having a tiling texture on it that's controlled by a vertex alpha that I painted in. And then the black value is where it fades out. So that's exactly what you get right here. So it fades into the pool of water at the bottom rather than being completely and utterly transparent or not trans, but opaque the entire way up. And this tree also uses a bit of uh, refraction as well, so it's it's got kind of a neat little visual effect to it. Um, and let me just say, I'm so happy that the bloom in Unreal Engine 4 is a bit more refined than UT3, UDK, because you can see uh, with, what do you call it, um, with alpha masks back in the day, like it actually renders behind them. So, or in some cases, completely cuts them off. So it gets like cut off behind these trees. Isn't that weird? <laughs> like it, it renders in front of it just slightly, but it renders behind it completely. So it's just like, oh uh, no. So yeah, it's very, very noticeable to me and uh, kind of drove me nuts because I couldn't figure out how to fix it. There weren't as many tutorials online back then. So let's see. Uh, do I, uh, Robson wants to know, do I use ZBrush to add details to my models? I do not. Uh, I, I try to avoid using sculpting packages as much as I can. It's not because I can't sculpt. I've, I've actually sculpted quite a few things. I just prefer to work quickly and I get, I, I feel like I lose sight of what I'm trying to do if I have to go through all of these monotonous steps to get to that point. So if, if I have to go through the, the work of building every single thing known to man, when I already have a content library that does most of what I want, there are times when I'll just go into the Megascans library and just I'll kit bash things together to, to make them look the way I want. I mean, that's really nothing that I didn't already do here. I, I mean, some of this kind of looks like I sculpted it, doesn't it? Like, 
maybe not perfectly, but it does have that effect that it looks like sculpted stone in some regards. And if I had done that in ZBrush, it would have taken me a lot longer because instead of just immediately jumping in and getting those shapes hammered out and beaten up and worn inside of Mixer, I would have had to have gone into another tool, sculpted it out, adjusted it, and then hoped that it all would have translated over as well as I wanted instead of just having the end result right then and there. That's just, um, I feel like to me it's cutting out the middleman and just getting straight to the point. And when I can see the end result the way I want to see it, rather than having to hope that it's going to turn out the way I want or try to envision it, I feel like I am more involved in the artistic process and it's less of a chore. Now, ZBrush is fantastic. Don't even get me wrong. I'm not knocking it whatsoever. Uh, there are some things that you just can't do without ZBrush. And there are some things that ZBrush, to me, I, I just don't need to use it for. And I think most of the scene just didn't require it. So, uh... Parallax Virtual, can you show us how to set up a foliage brush with a Quixel asset? That is a great question, and I was in the middle of that, and I got off into the weeds, didn't I? All right, so here's the foliage. All right, so you can see all the different foliage brushes that I have in here. They're all pretty simple. Uh, we'll start with these lilies, and we'll just have it set up to paint on static meshes. So you can, you know what? Actually, let's not do that. It's going to look goofy. We'll just come in here and erase them from this area. Okay. So when you look in here and you see that I've got this big hole that I just painted out in the ground with some roots and whatnot as the texture, it looks a little barren, right? Let's move this over a little bit. So the settings for this are pretty simple. It's all about trying to make it varied and interesting. I have a radius of 15. Uh, I usually work in two meter units, so 200 would be a radius of two meters. So that would be like pretty much the size of this entire block. So that gives you an, an idea of what to look at. So from this point to this point, is 200 in that foliage brush okay so 15 is most likely here to here so that means these uh, particular instances will never get much closer than here to here so they're not going to duplicate over each other too much and, and cause a lot of crazy clipping issues the density can be left as it is you can increase or decrease it as needed uh, that just essentially says how much of this is going to get painted down within a certain area uh, I always play with a scale um, I like to make sure that these have a natural feel, and if they're all the same exact size, it doesn't look anywhere near as good as though it's all uh, unique. So, like, this is all the same size, the way I'm painting this, right? Every plant is exactly the same height, and you can see how different it looks compared to the background, that there's plants that are different sizes compared to it. It just looks kind of artificial, like plastic plants that you'd buy from Joanne Fabric. So if I change this down to 0.8 and then set this back to 1.5. Now you start getting various sizes in here that really look like wild growth rather than pre-planned artificial turf. All right, so that's, that's something to consider as well. You can also play with the Z offset, which will then make some of these plants drop further into the ground. Um, that's actually really good to show on the static meshes because it's just, there's nothing there. So it's a little bit easier to see. So if we set the, the minimum down to like negative 20 and the maximum down to negative 20 you'll see the plants actually get stuck halfway through so that they're uh, most of them is below the ground so that's what the the z offset is good for um it's it's really useful for what is it uh like trees and whatnot if you want to if you followed along with the last live stream i did solo with the uh, hall of oaks that i did or sorry hall of memories that used a Z offset, or would have used a Z offset if I planted the trees using the foliage painter instead of manually. But like with trees, you can just sink them directly into the ground and then they become bushes. Because again, as I said last time, trees are nothing more than, or bushes are nothing more than trees stuck halfway into the ground. Uh, if you can't tell that they're not a bush because they're a tree in the ground, then you've done your job right. Because it's just one less, or one fewer step you need to make. Um, some of these other things in here, like the random pitch angle, it just makes it so that when you place these things, they rotate in certain ways. So as you see, the, the angle is now like 70. So they're kind of like going crazy, pointing in random directions, um, stuff like that. It, it just it helps create variation. I try not to go too much with that. I think f a, a random angle of five for small brush like that is good. Otherwise, it starts looking like somebody came in and just started using like a shovel and just started uprooting these plants at random. So that's that's something I try not to mess with. Uh, everything else in here uh, doesn't have too much of an effect for what I'm doing currently, except for affecting distance field lighting. And even then that's not really doing much 
just because the distance fields don't have much of an effect in a scene that's mostly lit from these lights. If this was a wild open environment with the sun being the primary source, uh, I would definitely want these plants to get hit with distance field lighting because then the DFAO would really kick in and make them look a lot more lush. So yeah, that's something to be aware of. So, I mean, I hope that gives you guys a good overview of what to expect with the foliage brush. Um, again, this looks like a lot of work. Most of the work really is just planning. It's just kind of playing around and seeing how do I want this to look? Is this really going to be what the, the garden of a goddess looks like? I don't know, but I think it looks neat. Uh, for example, like these elephant ears, um, they're, they're huge, but they look really nice when you kind of add them as accents. Of course, not too much, but just a little bit. You don't want them clipping into the other plants too, so kind of you kind of have to be really careful with them because they're huge and they tend to just go everywhere. So if you zoom in, sometimes like it's okay if they clip if nobody can see it. In this case, there's a clipping right there, but I think like from a distance, nobody can tell. I can't even tell anymore, so I'm just gonna leave it there as it is. Um, one thing I did mention is that I'm gonna be giving out the materials that I've been using in this scene, so like my masters and whatnot. You guys are more than welcome to have them. I keep updating them, so every time I make a, a new scene, I usually make changes to them. Oh, well, I've been pretty happy with them so far, and most of them just relate to these, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, material functions that I've developed. So like this one right here, my primary texture input, this is the magic that makes everything happen here. This is all a bunch of super simple stuff. It looks really complex, but I trust me, it's not. Everything is driven by a U and V parameter, uh, and these are something that you can create an instance of that allows you to change the tiling of these maps on the fly. So it really gives you some control of the end result. The normal strength, uh, changing this constant for vector allows you to change the strength of the normals. I use this on plants all the time. Uh, Megascan's data looks amazing in engine. It looks even better when you push some of the normals. Um, that's something to be aware of. I'll go over that in a little bit too. Wow, this stream really flew past. It's already 142. <laughs> oh my gosh. Maybe we'll, we'll go a little longer today. I, I don't feel like I've covered everything just yet. Uh, if I ever want to use specularity, uh, that's another hot button topic that people talk about, like you should never use it. Um, I'm of the opinion that you should use whatever works. If it looks good and works, that's fine. It doesn't matter if it's physically accurate or not. Whether or not it looks good is all that matters. And specularity in Unreal is not specularity in the traditional sense. I cannot stress that enough. Specularity in Unreal means that it is essentially the index of refraction of the particular material. Uh, and I said essentially, don't quote me on that. That's my understanding of it. Uh, really all you need to know is that the higher the specular strength, the more it's going to reflect light. The lower the specular strength, the less it's going to reflect light. That is not the same as it being rough or smooth. That is the same as it actually being able to reflect that light back at you. So the specular strength is normally only advised to be used for things like milk or other assets that have like a, like a an interesting like reflective capability. I use it sometimes just for artistic effect to get certain shadows in the materials that I don't want to be, what's the best way to put it? I don't want them like maybe crevices in like this, uh, in this particular texture that I don't want to reflect light whatsoever. So that gives me a more artistic control over it. Now I'm currently not using it in this scene. I think I have it set up on a, what do you call it? I think I have it set up on a material instance control, but I may have actually turned it off. So yeah, I, I think I turned it off for a while, but I do use it on the terrain. So you can kind of see it in action here. If I was to hide the all the plants and the foliage and whatnot, you can actually see the specularity in, in, in action. So the gray values here are actually 0 0.5 and everything else is not. So 0 0.5 is the default specular value, which means it reflects the normal amount of light you would expect to see in Unreal. And anything below that and the darker values is where it's more shadowed. So we can actually play with that if you want to see what it looks like in real time. Uh, here we go. Let's do it in front of this light here so it's a little easier to see. If I go to this terrain material and I open it up to the instance. So we'll come in here and you'll see how I have my terrain material set up as well. There's a lot of values in here and it, it's a bit more complicated than it looks, but it's really not. Uh, let's see here. Layer 1, specular strength and power. So 24 for the strength and the power is set to 2. Think of this like Photoshop levels, like I'm essentially clamping these values. 
So we'll set the values back to default. So let's look at the specularity again, uh, which should be under specular. Here we are. So if I set this to one and one, okay, actually better yet, set it to 50. Okay, now it's completely specular. All right, now let's change it back to where it was, 24 and two. You see how these little parts right here stopped emitting as much light? So if I set it back to 50 again, you see the little highlights that are there? Put this back to two, see how they kind of go away? So it gives you like micro control over those reflections that maybe you don't want every bit of this to reflect light. Maybe you want a little bit more control over that. Maybe you want this to look more like dirt and less like uniform levels of like micro dirt. It's 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 one of those things you've got to play with. So again, that's that's a, that's a thing to keep in mind with all of this. Maybe it's not physically accurate, but that's not really my concern. It's I'm not about strict adherence to rules. I'm about what does what does what's the best way to make this look? I guess is the best way to put that. Does it look good? Sure. Is it physically accurate but doesn't look good? Not so good. So is it possible to get both? Absolutely. But I haven't really had the time to delve into that. So I just kind of play it by ear and, and just mess with that. And I think that's the best way to learn whatever you're working with too is don't just be don't be a strict rules adherent. Try to like understand what it is that these things are doing, like these these rules that we're adhering to, and then don't be afraid to break them. If it looks bad, it looks bad. You know, you can always fix these things. It's not like um, I'm not an expert and I'm not the best artist ever. I just learn by you know playing around and breaking things. And what I don't break, I improve on. And what I break, I fix. So if if you're not failing at least at one point in your life, you're not doing something right. Or either that, or you're just superhuman. In which case. I guess you don't really need a stream to help you out. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, yeah, let's see. Man, you guys you guys are so nice in the comments. You have all these nice things to say. Really make me feel special. I love you guys. Thanks for, thanks for being part of our community. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so I've covered most of these things, but another thing I wanted to cover too is material function collections. I didn't actually talk about that. And that is what's controlling these lights and these orbs. So you may not notice it right now because it's super like, um, I, I, the, the word escapes me. Subtle, it's super subtle, there we are. So if we go to functions in my, what is it? Where, where is it at here? I have a, material function collection ah there it is so here it is this is a material function collection i've actually named it sign time because these lights are being controlled by a sign parameter which is basically for those of you who don't know it's a, look at like a wave it's just moving up and down on a on an xy axis so it's going left or right just up and down forever at this particular value this value is controlling what would normally be a parameter so i would actually have this called sign time in here and this would only affect if this was hooked up to this whoops if this was hooked up to this this parameter would only be controlled by an instance of this material the material parameter collection actually is something that can control like this if as long as you put this in any of your scene in materials this can be controlled independent of these materials that is mind-blowing I have been wanting something like this for as long as I've been working with this engine. It's like, to me, it's like, why do I have to make these changes in every material? Why can't I just do it all at once? Now you can. You can absolutely do this all at once. It is incredible. So check this out. When I go in here and change the sign time from 0.25 to 1, I'm controlling both the orb moving in and out and the light that is being controlled by it, the function parameter. See? Now watch this. Uh, let's go back to the light, okay? And whoop, well, Unreal makes this thing super small. I wish it didn't do that. There. Okay, so let's go back to the light function. Actually, there's a parameter for that. Let's find it. Here it is, function pulsating orb light. So this thing. All right, so let's try changing the light brightness so it's a little bit more obvious what's going on here. You see that? That is being, con these are two different materials being controlled by one option, this right here. This is so cool. I, I cannot get over how awesome this is. Look at that. Look at that, it's like magic. We let's have a seizure. Actually, that's not. Somebody might actually have issues with that. 
Um, so I can actually now control the intensity of these lights in real time without having to enter these values into two different materials simultaneously. That is mind blowing to me. I have been wanting this for so long and it, it just, it makes working in this engine, which was already a breeze to begin with, even more of a breeze. Like the, the guys at Epic, man, I love you. You guys do such amazing work with this engine. It, every, every release makes this even easier. So yeah, again, material function parameters. It's really easy to set up too. Uh, as I said, like all you gotta do really, I'll even show you how to make one. Come in here, make a new material. Let's see, it's, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I think it's under regular material. So we just go in here, open this up and then we should be able to change this to, actually it's not that, it's, it's something else, oh, hold on. Ah, there it is. That's what we're looking for, material parameter collection. So you right click inside of the editor, the content browser, material parameter collection, you come in there and then in here you define what it is that you want to control so you call it whatever it is like uh, would you drop down please thank you so you call it like this thing i want to control okay and then you set that to whatever it is and then you take that into whatever material it is that you want to work with so say we go back to one of my master materials which would be under here and then open up the master environment which is here all right I'm having so many tabs up here that it's getting hard to grab up here without closing stuff. So let's close a couple of these off. All right. And then we can then go back to the content browser real quick. And the easiest way to do this is to drag and drop this directly into the scene. So grab this one, drop it in. All right. It's called none. It just needs a proper name, but that's why you change it to that thing that I want to control. So, I mean, obviously you would have a better name for it, but whatever it is, Instead of it being, say it was dither amount for the uh, temporal AA uh, blending that, that uh, Jack McKelvey showed off a couple streams back, it would be this instead. And then when you have this set up across however many different materials, you can control all of them at the same time. That is just, it's mind blowing how powerful that is. And what I just showed you is one of the most basic ways to set this up. You could probably tie this into a blueprint so that when the light kind of fades out it actually affects the volumetric lighting as well so these bits of fog here um, that's a that's a an interesting effect of the function parameters is that they don't like for lights is that they don't affect the volumetrics so i could turn this light completely off and i will even watch this and it still lights up the the fog even though it should be off because the light's off well i mean it looks like it's on but it's off in the, in the parameter so the way I've got it set up now is not the correct way to make it work with volumetrics. You actually need a blueprint for that. And that's a little bit out of my expertise, but it's one of those things that again, um, I should learn it and everybody else should too. The parameters and, and blueprints are just incredible and you can do so many cool things with them. So let's see. Uh, it's my gaming seat would like to know how hard is the learning curve if you've never used Unreal before? I'm coming from very minimal knowledge in Unity from high school. All right, so let me take a sip of water here. Essentially, I like to look at Unity and Unreal as two different, completely different philosophies. Unity to me, and again, this is my personal opinion and mine only, so please don't take offense to any of this. It's, it's not even meant to be offensive in the slightest, but Unity to me is like Apple. Okay, they have a very cohesive ecosystem. They have a very specific way that they would like you to work with their assets in their engine. Unreal is very much like Android. It is a software in an application that works right out of the box, but to really get the most out of it, you need to dive deep into it. And I, this is coming from a guy that used to root his phone. I, I, I've been using HTC phones forever and I have I can't even tell you how many times I've rooted my HTC phone to get like no ads on it so that like whenever I would go to load an app, like the the host file, I would I would actually modify the host file on the phone so that the, the ad servers would always redirect to 127.0.0 so they always would never load, which was just bliss. <laughs> but that's, that's getting into the weeds, but that's just kind of like what I mean by the differences between them. With Unity, like setting up materials is usually a drag and drop process, very simple. With uh, like Unreal, you have to know how to set these materials up to begin with. So like when you look at these textures and you see how they're actually set up this is all like i had to know how to set these things up to get to this point whereas with unity like you usually just have like a very simple 
like drag and drop this texture to this box and it's already done and set up and it looks good enough to just instantly go whereas unreal you want like if you didn't know what this was in unreal you would have no idea what i'm talking about but this is actually that material function i was telling you guys i'm gonna just give away later on today when on the the tools group or sorry art community because this is the kind of stuff that really helps just make this easier for you to work now you don't really even need to use this material if you don't really want to you can just use the live link from bridge and it sets all this up for you as well um, the bridge live link actually i would even recommend using it over mine because it's it doesn't require as much technical knowledge in the engine but if you're somebody who likes to dig around and play with stuff like go for it i'll, I'll put them up for you if you want to try them out so just something to be aware of um that, that's to me like that's that's the difference so if you want to get into unreal uh it's my gaming seat that's how you should look at this unreal is going to be a bit of a time investment they all are to get to get good at any engine is going to take some time to really invest into it but like unreal's material editor is a beast into itself it is like this is an entire like there are people who do nothing but make unreal materials in studios because it is such a powerful workflow and there's so many things you can do with it i mean i i am only scratching the surface i am very very uh, like these are very basic materials like they may seem very very complex but trust me this is not even touching like world position modifiers or anything of that nature this is all just pretty simple stuff now that could be my personal bias maybe I'm just prone to thinking everything I do is easy because I'm doing it uh, so maybe it's more of like a moderate level of, of work but trust me there are some crazy materials out there and this is not one of them so uh, Adita wants to know, do these materials, uh, uh, Mega Sans assets, do they work with Unity? Absolutely. Yeah, there's no reason why they wouldn't. Really, they're just models and textures. They work with anything that is PBR compliant, and if they're not PBR compliant, you can even take some of the output from these textures and turn them into old gen by, like, overlaying the AO map over the uh, diffuse map or albedo map and then turning that into an old-style diffuse map. There's a lot of different ways you can convert these things back and forth. So yeah, there, you can you can work with these in any any application you want. So uh, Ryan L, is this a concept tutorial or an actual space for a game that I'm making and explaining as I go? Uh, it was a game that I possess neither the skill nor the talent to make. Sad, uh, <laughs> sad trombone noises, unfortunately there. Uh, but it is a concept tutorial. This is one of the first uh, videos we're going to do where we're actually showing you guys our work in progress. So, like, if you want to, for those of you guys who missed the beginning of this, the whole purpose of this stream is how do you get from point A to point B? So, um, again, like, I start with making my textures in Mixer. So, like, these textures, like this, for example, is made in Mixer. This wall texture is made in Mixer. These are assets, like these plants that I brought in from the Megascans library. The fog is a simple volumetric fog setup. Uh, with some particle effects that are, are terribly not hard to set up at all. I actually probably should go over that just to show you guys some of this stuff. I don't want to show you my particles folder because it looks stupid, <laughs> but I will show you at least the way these, uh, these particles look so you have an idea of what they are. So I needed the Firefly material because my original had that. So essentially, you know, I have a material called insect underscore Firefly. This is just a simple texture I made in Photoshop as a 16-bit alpha, which is this right here or sorry um, ah, that's the material not the texture I just messed myself up this is the texture so just this thing right here it's 128 uh, by 128 so it's super small it's meant to be seen like this not like this so that's why it looks all blurry and gross um, this is a pretty basic setup for uh, material um, I have it set up so if I want to use a sign to make it even more Firefly-like, I can by using this parameter, just by switching it on and off. And those same functions that we I talked about before are on the side here controlling it. This emissive color is exposed, so I can change the emissive color at any point to whatever I want it to be. Uh, the albedo color doesn't really matter too much, but it's there if I want to change it. The emissive strength is there to multiply it and make it go crazy. So if I want some... some uh, jj abrams level star trek lens flares i can easily get that by just making that value jump to 200 so now these things are like oh look at that it's the future now there's lens flares everywhere look at that you like the future don't you look at all them lens flares so you get that right so it gives you that option to change these things in real time and 
like if you're not using instances, you, oh god, you should be. They're they're one of the easiest ways to work in this engine. So it's it really makes these things uh, just so much easier to adjust and and play with. So back to the material itself and the actual. Oh god, there's I keep messing this up when I drag over because there's so many things that are open currently. So let me close this out. One second, it's updating texture streaming data. I actually cannot. There, there it goes. Okay, now I can drag it back over. So yeah, this um, this material is pretty simple. It spawns 40 of these at a time. They last for anywhere from one second to five seconds. Anywhere in between, they can they can die out between then or not. Uh, their size is determined by a uniform scale, so I don't want them changing size. Although it could look cool if I set them to be more like where they vary in size over time so maybe they would pulsate and get larger or smaller so in terms of world units they're eight millimeters by 18 so they're not too large but not too small either um, their velocity is controlled so they kind of move in a circle or in, in a sphere uh, the color over life is set as a basic setup so that they just fade in and out uh, they look really goofy and, and very distracting if they just pop in so when they fade in and out they're much more like fireflies the sphere actually controls where they form. So if you want to see that in action, an easy way to do this is to set the spawn up to 4,000, or not 4,400. Okay, so now I'm spawning a whole bunch more of them. All right, and then we go to the sphere, and then we set this to 500, and you'll see that they're actually contained within a sphere. And the more that you spawn, the more easy it is to see the sphere. So if we double that to 800, suddenly you have a very obvious sphere. Looks kind of cool, right? But it's it's a little too constrained. So I'll put it back to 40 and change the sphere size back to 1200 so that they're kind of in this area, but it's not very obvious that they're being constrained to a sphere. And then I have them set up so they're accelerating as they exist longer in the world. And then they just kind of spin around in circles with this orbit on occasion. So that if you look at them, you'll watch some of them kind of just randomly be like oh look at him on firefly i'm gonna spin around in circles for no apparent reason because i'm a bug and i don't have a very large brain so there's that so that, that's that's part of the ambience of this environment too like you can't really have magic without fireflies in my opinion so you, you're gonna have to have that in there and it, it kind of evokes that like you know those days of youth where you run around in the open fields at night and, and dusk and you'd see all the little bugs flying around everywhere uh, we don't get too many of those here in florida however um my theory is that the only native firefly to this particular state is the mosquito. Uh, I'm not very fond of them, but I'm sure everybody in the world hates them as much as I do. So, um, yeah, I think we should probably wrap this up. I think I've covered pretty much everything that I can cover today. Uh, I'm looking forward to being done with this in the next month. This is, again, very early. I still have to go all the way to the end of this hallway and continue working on it. There are more assets I need to finish, uh, more plants that I need to plant. Um, and as I'm renovating my house and actually planting a lot of these plants in real life, let me tell you, it's a lot easier doing this in Unreal than it is in real life. I, I'm in pain from how much I've been bending over and sitting on my knees trying to dig in the dirt to get these things in place, much less like renovate my house to get it ready. So, but yeah, this, this thing extends all the way to the back here. And there's a giant crescent moon here, uh, which just kind of like finishes off this little area and a nice bright fiery sunset in the background now this is an hdr from no emotion hdrs.net you guys should give them a visit uh they are free to use under i believe creative commons licensing so like make sure you credit them and they know that you know when you're using this stuff it's being used legally and all that fun stuff this is oh so you know i'll cover this too before we wrap up this is another material that i used um from one of my colleagues at quixel his name's owen and this is actually the default unreal Sky. Let's try loading up the correct one instead of the one that's not the correct one, which would require looking at the details panel and then scrolling to where the material is located, which is this right here. There we are. Much better. So you'll see this. Uh, this has actually got camera vectors associated with it. So this always has the sky being put exactly where it should be. So when you kind of zoom in a little bit, it always looks the way it should. And it always looks as though it's a real world that you're like almost like a window that you're looking through so this is oh yeah by the way no emotion.net pretty cool huh so what's going on here is this material has been modified by me over over the years like i originally used this from owen when i made my train scene and i did a really basic setup with it back then 
don't ask me how this all works. I don't understand it. I'm not a technical artist, but I, my understanding is the camera vector drives all of these particular effects so that it's almost like it's just forcing this to look at you no matter what you do. So you move this on to where it actually, where I've been making changes. So I've been setting this up to where I can actually control the level of the sky so that it's more of a, a Photoshop-like blend. So I've got an option here. I can switch between linear light blending and overlay blending. And this is really cool because it actually gives me the option to treat it like a polarizer. And for those of you who don't know what polarizing is, it's when you're like filtering out incidental light and you get something that's more like that. It basically adds more contrast. So when I change the polarizer to zero, there's no effect on it whatsoever. All right, and when I change from linear light to overlay, it's gonna take a second to recompile, so I'll give it a moment. Yeah, so linear light at zero, it's it's kind of crazy, but you see the, the level of control I get over, over these things, where this is about where it should be, it's like 0.25 in uh, a linear value is pretty close to like 0.5 in RGB, at least as far as this is concerned. And then I can change the brightness power to adjust how this actually looks in the end. So you get, all these levels of control to really make the sky looks like look like it's um, got that nice evening glow to it that you really only get when the sun's right below the horizon. So I'm taking the the HDRs that No Emotions put out, and I'm just really fiddling with them as much as I can to, to try to push these values until they look good. And again, none of this is phys physically accurate. It just looks cool, and that's the whole concept I'm trying to get across with anything that I do, is that. I don't care so much about the physical accuracy of the materials. I care very much about what it looks like in the end. And if I can't say this is 100% scientifically accurate, ultimately it doesn't matter to me. What does matter is, does this look cool? Does it work for what I want it to do? And when I come in here and then I go back to the beginning of the scene and then turn around and then I've got that sky framed with the trees in the background, yeah, I think that looks really cool and I'm very proud of how it looks. Uh, obviously, it's not my photograph, so I can't just be like, I did this all myself, but I did push it to the point where I thought it looked good enough to show off. So um, let's take some final questions here before we wrap up. The uh, the Killery likes to say, I see you have low frames on your project, but it looks good. Do you have any tips to optimize the scene so you get the most frames possible with no quality loss? Uh, to do that, I would say bake your lights. Again, these are all movable objects. So like this is a prefab blueprint that I've converted and whoop, wow thanks Windows 10 and this light component is completely movable if I bake the lighting it would run better if I set the attenuation radius lower it would also run better like if I set the attenuation down to 150 I should get a ton of extra frames although apparently not so that's not the issue here I think it's those trees at top just because each one of these has individual leaves. So there's a lot of ways I can optimize this, but ultimately, like I said in the beginning, this isn't so much about game art optimization. It's about optimizing so that I'm not running uh, to the point where it's so slow that it's chugging constantly, because then it's not fun to work in and it's more of a chore. So sometimes what I would do in these situations is grab the trees and actually move them into a group by hitting Control-G. That way I can, whenever I select one, I select all of them. So if I deselect this now and select that, I've selected them all. And if I want to get those frames back at least a little bit, now I can. And then I can just put them back by hitting Control H to unhide them again. So whenever I'm ready to do that final shot. So th there's, there's a lot of tips and techniques you can do. Sometimes you can turn off the foliage if you want to improve the rendering times, if that's not what you're currently focusing on. Maybe you need the extra frames to precisely move some objects around. Maybe you don't. It's all about what works for you. So just you know, play with this stuff, work with it see what works um any other questions you guys have let's see are you giving out the scene file i am not unfortunately uh, i just I, I can't give this out it's not even done yet so it wouldn't be much to give out currently if i was giving it out um yeah claudio asks is there ray tracing in the scene as one of our guys at quixel has mentioned there is no ray tracing this is on a 1080 ti uh, if i could run ray tracing on this it would run so slow as to be impossible to use I think that pretty much wraps it up. You guys are a great audience. It's always fun to come back and chat with you and show stuff off. Um, I, I really appreciate you guys let me, you know, be where I'm at to do these things to help you guys out. Because, like I said, I'm old enough to have been around for a while. And I know what it's like to not, like, when you're starting out on this stuff, it can seem monumental to to do. And it's like, 
what's the best way to put it? It's so hard to learn some of this stuff if it if it feels like you can never do it. And just having someone there to like just I wouldn't say hold your hand, but at least point you to the right direction. It's really really it's a good way to, to be right. Like I would have loved to have had this help when I was in college because when I was in college, like I knew how hard this was and it was kind of depressing because I knew the ideas that I had in my head and I knew what I wanted to make, but I didn't feel like I could do it because I didn't know how to get from point A to point B. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, um, I do need to wrap it up and I see Sanic that you wanted to know how to set up the fog. So yeah, you know what, real quick, let's, let's just show you how I do that. This is nothing more than a volumetric fog with some fog particles. So you can see the exponential height fog in here. The settings for that are super simple. They're actually almost default, except the, the height fall off is set to an artificial number. So instead of it being 0.2, which kind of, you see how it uh, like washes out the sky, which actually kind of looks cool. I don't know, maybe I'll leave it like that. But for now, I put it that at two. So I get more of that contrast in the sky, which pushes the fog down more to the ground. And let's see. Um, I've also set it to volumetric. That's really all I did here. Uh, for the fog itself, there is a fog material that I use. Let me actually grab the fog emitter. Where's it at? There it is. So the emitter here is being controlled by a particular material. Let me open that up for you one moment. I have so many different fog materials and instances. So here's my fog material. This is pretty easy. You can actually figure out how to set this up using um, Unreal documentation. But I've got this set up with an absolute world position being masked out by red and green with a little bit of scale. Dividing these over a noise map, which really doesn't do much in this setup, so you could probably get rid of all this. Another absolute world position into the B mask with some uh, parameters to control how far these things really appear. But it really only works in larger scenes. And then the extinction is the most important part. This is actually the 99% of what you see. The rest of that I could probably just delete. And I'll show you what that does. So the extinction actually controls how strong the fog really is. So if we go to the fog material, which is right here, uh, you can't, well, here it is. You can't really see it in here, so there's not really much of a point in showing it. But the extinction is set at 0 0.075. If I set that to 1, this is what it does. Does this kind of make sense to you guys? Like you see the blobs of fog moving now. If I set it to 0.5, it gets a little softer. 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.075. That's pretty much what the extinction does. Is it determines how hard the, the, the fog is and, and how much it takes up in terms of like light scattering. So having it like a nice mist like this is where I want it to be, but if I really needed it to be like crazy, I could put it back at one instead of where it is currently. But I like how soft it is because you can still see those shadows. So it kind of gives you that that nice, uh, like this is a morning mist kind of feel without being too overbearing. So this is all basic Unreal stuff. You can actually learn this by just going into the Unreal documentation. But if you guys ever have questions about this as I'm wrapping this up, please don't hesitate to come to the Quixel Art community, which is again, facebook.com slash groups slash quixel tools group all one word so yeah glad you guys are here uh, and again as i sign off just remember if i can do this you guys can too um i started off as somebody who barely knew how to use unreal engine and then over the years i've gotten at least halfway competent with it so whatever knowledge i have i like to impart on others because it's always better to leave the world in a better place than what you found it in and to teach others what you know because knowledge is ultimately only useful if you can pass it on to others so if you guys ever have questions or you want to know how these things are done or um, if i forget to upload these materials don't hesitate to poke me you can always tag me in the group i will gladly respond in minutes um yeah i think that should be it you guys are a great audience thanks for coming on thank you so much for being part